Hi, my name's Alyssa. Thanks for watching today. Before we get started, we wanted to fill you in on our church. Here at Grace, we have a mission and a purpose. Our goal is to help people discover truth, decide on Jesus, demonstrate change, and deploy for others. If you're looking for a church, we would love for you to come be a part of what God is doing here at Grace. You can check us out on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter. We would also like to invite you to one of our Sunday morning services. Check out ohiograce.com for a list of campuses and service times in your area. We have a great time gathering for music, hanging out, and learning about who God is and how that affects our lives. Thanks for watching, and we hope to see you here next week at Grace. Thanks again for being here at Grace. Uh, exciting things happening at Kalahari. We know uh, so far as of last night that 17 of our Grace students from our three campuses have indicated a decision to follow Christ, and so we're very excited about that. And then in addition to that, because this is a, a ministry that we lead that encompasses churches in our region, um, two, uh, they said around 200 uh, teenagers have also made that decision uh, beyond our church family. So great stuff. God is working and appreciate uh, all of you helping us make that happen. Uh, we're, we're in a series, Esther, and Esther's all about life when we can't control things. And of course, we can't control life. And so we've all experienced times where Things feel out of control. You know, things go wrong. Things that we don't plan on. Things happen that, that we didn't think would happen. And, and that could be in any area of our life. We could be in a situation in our marriage and we're just thinking, wow, I, I didn't think it would be this way. Or maybe we're in conflict with somebody uh, in a relationship at work or, or somewhere else or, or family or, or maybe it's financial issues or the stock market or you're just following politics and that's bothering you. It doesn't really matter. Whatever it is, we can't control things. But we depend on God's power, God's providence, God's sovereignty. Esther was a young lady who lived 2,500 years ago. And uh, not in the greatest circumstances. Basically, the book of Esther is is partly for the emotionally weary, people who feel outnumbered or outmaneuvered by fate. Things just didn't fall together like you thought they would. And we want to remind you of the, the historical context of the book. Tim spoke to this last Sunday that um, the book of Esther is in a unique time in Israel's history. Remember, God called Abraham. Abraham leaves the Ur of the Chaldees, goes into a, a place he's never seen before, Canaan. God promises that he's going to give him this land, but also promises Abraham that the whole world would be blessed through him, through his people. And, and we know that happened in a couple of different ways. One was the Jewish people were supposed to know God better than other peoples and teach other people about God. And then secondly, and most importantly, Abraham was promised that through his line that the, the Messiah would come, the Christ, and he would be the one who could take away sins of people who could specifically take away the right consequences of their sin, their penalty from people if they just trust in him. And so things started out for the Jewish nation a, a little rocky. 
and they kept drifting from God, even following other gods. And then God kept punishing them. And then finally, and and they would come back. And then finally, through the prophet Jeremiah, God said that he was going to punish them, that they were going to be in exile. And that's exactly what happened. First, Assyria conquered the northern kingdom of Israel, and then Babylon conquered Assyria and also Judah, the southern kingdom. That happened about 607 BC. And then when Babylon was in control, uh, there was a rebellion against them. And so Nebuchadnezzar came back and went into Jerusalem. But that time he destroyed the city and the temple. And so for that 20-year period between when they first conquered to when the temple was destroyed, the people in Jerusalem and the Israelite people, the Jewish people, were basically exiled in three different waves. First, it was the best and the brightest, but later it became, you know, just any, any landowners or whatever, the poor were always left there. And so now these people are exiled to Babylon. And Jeremiah told them this would happen because it was God's judgment on them. And they might as well get comfortable in Babylon because it was going to be 70 years so that they should build houses and, and plant crops because they're going to be there for a while. And that's exactly what happened. And then when the 70 years were over, Persia then conquered Babylon. And then that brought the exile to an end. And the Jewish people were allowed then to return to Israel. And many of them did. And they rebuilt Jerusalem and rebuilt the temple, although not in its splendor that it had. And all that was happening, but not everybody left. Some Jewish people stayed where they were. They had gotten comfortable in Persia. Things were going well for them. But all through that history, we see God at work. For example, even in the exile, and and, and we're thinking, well, that's just judgment. How's God working through that? Well, when the people then regathered in Israel after the exile, although they still drifted from God, we know that from history, they never again as a people turned to worship false gods like they had been doing before the exile. And so now you have these people, and again, we remind you that although God's never mentioned in the book of Esther. His divine plan is always at work. It's about his providence. And so during Esther's day, they're in Persia. These are people who have decided not to leave. Uh, Tim described for us last Sunday, Esther chapter one, where King Ahasuerus has a huge party. Uh, He's, he's, the most powerful man in the world, and he has a six-month-long party to celebrate and show off his splendor. And then that all sort of ends with a one-week-long drinking party, and then that drinking party sort of ends with the finale, and that is that king, we'll call him Xerxes, calls for his queen, Vashti, to come and model herself before all the drunken men at the party. And then something surprising happens, something unexpected. Vashti says, no. And that throws the, the king into a furious rage and all the nobles that are with them, they start realizing, whoa, whoa, whoa. If the most powerful man in the world can't tell his wife to do, what chance do we have of telling our wives what to do? They saw a problem here, and Xerxes is furious, so he calls a special emergency cabinet meeting, and then they decide to do a couple things. First, Vashti is banished. She's removed, her crown's taken away, and she's banished. She can never see the king again. Not sure how much of a punishment that was for Vashti, but, you know, boom, you can't ever see the king again. And then the second thing they did is they decided, hey, we're going to have a beauty pageant where we're going to round up all the young ladies from the entire realm when all of our providences, we're going to bring in the best-looking virgin 
young women to come in and then they're going to compete and they're each going to prepare for this, spend one night with the king, and then after that, the king will select the one that he wants to be his queen, and he will give her a rose or something like that, you know. <laughs> but, and so it's like the, just like the bachelor, there's not a lot of good outcomes for most of these ladies, right? For example, there are basically four things that would happen to all these women. One, they spent a night with the king, and the king was not impressed at all. But they weren't allowed then to go back to their regular life. They then spent their entire life in the king's harem, even though they would never see the king again. Because back in those days, women that the king slept with were not allowed to sleep with other men. And so she's just stuck. She would live like a widow in a harem for the rest of her life, never see the king. The second outcome could be that uh, the king kind of likes the young lady. Well, then she becomes a concubine. That means she enters into the harem, and then occasionally when the king thinks about her, he might call her name, because there were a lot of names, and then bring her And she would please the king for a night, and that would just happen once in a great while. The third way would be that he likes her quite a bit, and she becomes a legitimate wife of the king, which basically means she's like a concubine. The difference is if she bears any children, those children become heirs to the king. Or the fourth result is a young lady could become his favorite wife. And he would proclaim her queen. And then she would live her life serving the king. Either way, you're, the life you thought you were going to have is over. It's all different. That's how it happens. That's the way it goes. And when you, Here in this story, God seems hidden as far as Esther's concerned. But all God followers... You need to always trust that he's at work. God's at work at all times and in all your circumstances. And the first thing that we notice as we break out chapter 2 is that God's at work even when you're confused. Even when the path forward is not clear. Even when you don't know if you should or shouldn't be doing this and you're, you're kind of stuck. You have no clear direction God's still at work, and we're going to pick it up in Esther chapter 2, verse 5, left off with verse 4 last week. So beginning in verse 5, it says this. Now, there was at the citadel in Susa a Jew whose name was Mordecai, son of Jer, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite, who'd been taken into exile from Jerusalem with the captives who had been exiled with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had exiled. And so here, Mordecai and Esther, we're going to find out, were Jews who chose to stay in Persia. So they're living in Susa, which would be like to us, they're living in Capitol Hill in Washington. And That doesn't really mean much to us, but for an ancient Jewish reader, as they read this, they would would come up with a question, and that would be, why? Why would Mordecai be living in Susa? He had the opportunity to return back to the, the Jewish land, back to Israel. Why is he still there? And part of that reason, and the other thing is, why is he living in the city? Most Jewish people lived in a separate community. What what's going on here? And part of the reason is probably because Mordecai worked for the government. But they're a religious minority in a pagan culture. And so we have to understand this context of, and it's the same thing we face, and that is how do you relate to a dominant culture that is hostile to your faith? So every Christian has to figure this out. How do we live in a dominant culture that for us is increasingly hostile to our faith. And people do that in different ways. And it's interesting now because we look back at Esther and we sort of judge her different, different groups. What's interesting to me is if you're a person that's more left-leaning or more liberal in your thinking, 
traditionally they've looked at Esther and they're not impressed at all because they're like, oh, she sold out. She's being used as an object. Vashti didn't allow that, but, but Esther just jumps right in. You know, she's in there. She becomes the queen. She's not protesting or anything. They would rather hold up Vashti as a hero. But then on the flip side, even the conservative God followers, they'll many times look at Esther and they're not impressed either because they feel like, hey, Esther should have gone back. She's compromising. She's living in this pagan world. We find out she's hiding her identity as a Jewish person. It's compromise, compromise. She's breaking the dietary laws. She's not living like a Jew. She's not doing what Daniel did in this same exile a few years before, and they knew about Daniel. He wasn't holding strong like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. No, she's not doing that. She's caved. And so Esther doesn't catch a break from either side at first. Many Jews and Christians don't like reading Esther because of this seemingly what appears to be moral compromise in her life because we want to think that God blesses the morally pure and and yeah, that's true. God wants us to be pure. But the whole story of the Bible is more about grace than purity. It's more about mercy than obedience. And so God can use us, we're reminded, in spite of our past. And no matter where we've been, we need to follow God where we're at. The story continues in verse 7. He, talking about Mordecai, he was bringing up Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had no father or mother. Now, the young lady was beautiful of form and face. Kind of an interesting breakdown here. You know, the author's telling us, wow, nice body and pretty face. You know, she's hot, you know, is kind of getting it getting that across. And when her father and her mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. So Mordecai's her cousin, older cousin, and takes her in. And we get from this that Esther's life hasn't been all roses. It's been a little dicey. She's an orphan girl. She's at risk. She has an older cousin who sort of adopts her and takes care of her. And she's living at this time when for the people of God, God seems silent. I mean, through the whole book, we've mentioned God's name is never mentioned. Prayer is only hinted at, right? No visions, no prophets, no concern for God's laws. None of that is in here. Seas do not part. Manna does not come down from heaven. The lame do not walk. I mean, you get the picture? God seems silent, distant. It's a time of confusion in a pagan land. They're probably wondering, what should we be doing? Should we stay here? Is this good? Should we go back? Is that good? Should we leave this? They've gotten comfortable. What do we do? They're just trying to figure out. And God's at work in all these circumstances. We keep seeing this over and over through the pages of Scripture. It always happens this way. Trust that he's at work even when you're confused. But also trust God that he's at work even when you're in crisis. Even when now the confusion has faded and you're in a tailspin. Your life just takes a turn and you've lost all control. Here Esther is drafted with hundreds of girls into this international beauty pageant to compete for Xerxes' affection. And by all accounts, we're looking at this realizing she has no choice in the matter. She's just taken 
That's the way it is. We'll pick it up in verse 8. So it came about when the command and decree of the king were heard, and many young ladies were gathered to the citadel of Susa into the custody of Haggai, that Esther was taken to the king's palace into the custody of Haggai, who was in charge of the women. Now, the young lady pleased him, and he found, fa- and found favor with him. So he quickly provided her with her cosmetics and food and gave her seven choice maids from the king's palace and transferred her and her maids to the best place in the harem. Esther did not make known her people or her kindred, for Mordecai had instructed her that she should not make them known. Every day Mordecai walked back and forth in front of the court of the harem to learn how Esther was, how Esther was and how she fared. So it's a terrible situation as it breaks out. How did she feel? I mean, she had no choice. All of a sudden, just life events take over, and she's just flowing down this stream. She can't do anything about it. Life's out of control. This is not the way she saw things playing out. She probably envisioned that someday she would get married to a nice Jewish boy, and they would have some means and have the nice house and a little picket fence and a bunch of kids, and you know that's the way she saw it all happening. But now none of that's going to happen that way. And Esther hears nothing from God. And she's left to take one step at a time based on on the understanding and the faith that she has, whatever that is. The same thing for us. Because it happens to all of us. We experience loss and tragedy and crisis that, that we didn't see coming that just came into our life unexpectedly, just like this does in Esther's life. And at times like that, as believers, we must remain confident in God's love, God's justice, God's mercy, and God's grace. Why that's hard is because the means that God uses to work out his plan in history. It's hard for us to understand. We can't see it oftentimes from our limited perspective. We cannot grasp or understand the complexities We're all the interconnections of everything that's happening. It's all a mystery to us. But through it, God will give us enough light. We won't be able to see everything, but God will provide for us enough light to take each step, one step at a time. That's what God will do for us. And through it, we'll have confidence in his love and his sovereignty, knowing that he's always in control. So back to Persia. In Persia, the beauty contest, the rules kind of play out this way, and we'll pick it up where we left off, verse 12. Now, when the turn of each young lady came to go into King Ahasuerus, after the end of her 12 months under the regulations for the women... For the days of their beautification were completed as follows. Six months with oil of myrrh and six months with spices and the cosmetics for women. The young lady would go in to the king in this way. Anything that she desired was given to her to take with her from the harem to the king's palace. In the evening she would go in and in the morning she'd return to the second harem to the custody of Shashgaz the king's eunuch who was in charge of the concubines. She would not again go into the king unless the king delighted in her and she was summoned by name. And there are a lot of names, right? Now, when the turn of Esther, the daughter of Abihail, the uncle of Mordecai, who had had taken her as his daughter, 
When her time came to go into the king, she did not request anything except for what Haggai, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the women, advised. And Esther found favor in the eyes of all who saw her. So do you get this? Ladies, spa treatment, 12 months. Every day. Sound good? Sound pretty good? Yeah. Yeah, sometimes I ask, you know, how long, for you ladies, how What's the longest time you ever spent getting ready for a date? Yeah, don't shout that out. No, that's, yeah, just remain silent. How many of you spent more time getting ready for the date than you actually spent on the date? You know, sometimes that happens. How many of you had more fun getting ready for the date than you actually had on the date? See, sometimes that happens too. Twelve months of getting ready for this one night with the king. That's the prep time. So we trust that God's at work when we're confused and we don't really understand the times we're living in. Why is this happening? Why is God doing this? Trust God. And then we trust God when we're in crisis mode, when all of a sudden our life takes a turn and we're just swept away and the life we thought we would live is gone and we're into this no man's land. We don't know what's going to happen. But we also have to learn to trust God even when we're successful. That's funny, odd, because a lot of times it's when, and I think this is especially true of people in our culture, in our country. Because it's when people are successful and things have worked out well and their life has gone good and they're financially secure, I think that's when a lot of people listen to God less than any other time in their life because they feel like they've got everything under control. It continues in verse 16. So Esther um, was taken to King Ahasuerus to his royal palace in the 10th month, which is the month of Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign. The king loved Esther more than all the women, and she found favor and kindness with him more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Then the king gave a great banquet, Esther's banquet, for all his princes and his servants. He also made a holiday for the provinces and gave gifts according to the king's bounty. And when the virgins were gathered together the second time, then Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. And Esther had not yet made known her kindred or her people, even as Mordecai had commanded her. For Esther did what Mordecai told her as she had done when under his care. So we have this passage here where against all odds, Esther's chosen. And the king is happy and he throws a party and he declares a holiday and he gives out gifts. He grants some tax relief. And things seem better. Because we never know how it's going to turn out. The, the odd thing is, is a lot of times we get angry with God when things are not going the way that we want them to go. We get angry with God for that. Why? Because God's not working. Something isn't happening. Something isn't right. God's not working in my life. Well, how do you know that? Because you can't know that. Because you just, we all just have this limited perspective of our life. We don't see the whole picture. We don't see what God is up to. We, we can't recognize what God's doing. He works in all circumstances for his purposes. And that's the same thing that the New Testament teaches us too, right? Romans 8.28 We've all heard it, right? And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. God's telling us that if we're following him, we are under his care. He loves us. He will protect us. He will watch over us. We'll go through some stuff, but God is not going anywhere The God who's over history 
The God who spoke the universe into being is powerful and he's loving and he's working right now, right here in your life today to accomplish his purposes. And sometimes we get frustrated because we know that God's been known to intervene dramatically, to do miracles, like we said, to split the Red Sea, to have manna fall from heaven, to to see a virgin give birth, to watch life come out of a tomb. And when we don't see that in our life, we think God absent. But all through Scripture, right? For every divine shout like that, there are a million divine whispers. That's the story of Esther, and that's usually the story of us. But do not think God is not here. He, maybe it seems to you he's absent in your life. But he's actually calling us to trust him, to follow him every day in every circumstance that he has a plan that is unfolding all around us as God, through his Son, redeems the world. And we as his people were part of that. He invites us to be players in that. He wants us to trust him. And of course that starts with us trusting him for salvation. That starts with all of us being able to look back to a point in our lives where we know that at some point we realized that we needed outside help, that we couldn't make ourselves acceptable before God, that we couldn't make ourselves God and put ourselves higher than him, that there is a God, there is a creator, and that we've rebelled against him, we've sinned against him, we've alienated ourselves against him but that God loved us and still loves us and made a way through all his planning, all his working, through all of history for the Messiah, Jesus Christ, to come 2,000 years ago and to die on a cross voluntarily to make the right and just payment for our penalty for sin. But we have to turn to him and trust. We have to come to him on his terms. And we have to figure out, as we look back over our life, are we sure that there's a point in our life where we've made that decision to trust Christ? And if we're confused about that, we need to clear that up because there's no more important decision We have to be able to look back and identify the point in our life where we gave our life to him. Because that changes us from the inside out. That doesn't mean you never do anything wrong after that. But that you have a different perspective on your entire life. And that you come to realize that your life really is owed to him. And so have you done that if you haven't? It's the most important decision that you'll ever make. But that's not where I want to end with Esther. There's actually a last paragraph in chapter 2 that's, that's kind of weird. It seems a little out of place. We don't really understand it. It starts where we left off in verse 21. It says, in those days, and that, this is later now, Esther's queen. We don't know. Some amount of time has passed. And in those days, while Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, he's an employee, works for the government, Big Dan and Teresh, two of, king's, two of the king's officials from those who guarded the door, became 
angry and sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. But the plot became known to Mordecai, and he told Queen Esther, and Esther informed the king in Mordecai's name. Now, when the plot was investigated and found to be so, they were both hanged on a gallows. And then this last phrase, and it was written in the book of Chronicles in the king's presence. Kind of one of those details, and we think that's kind of an odd little tagline, right? And we find out, no. Even that, that seems odd and inconsequential, will carry great weight and great meaning before this story is over as we continue in the story of Esther next Sunday. Let's stand together for prayer. Father God in heaven, we thank you for your goodness. Lord, thank you for bringing us together. Thank you for the opportunity we have to look at your word And God, we pray that you'd help us to apply its principles to our lives. Lord, that even when you seem hidden, even when we can't see your hand, you're always working. Even when disaster, crisis strikes our life, Lord, that you have a plan and a purpose. And if we're yours, you want the best for us. So, God, help us to rest in your loving care. And, Lord, beyond that, help us to live with a sense of purpose and meaning. Lord, as you bring about your purposes in this world, and when we see the world going off and failing and what's going to happen next and what's going on in our country and in the world, Lord, we have this quiet confidence that you're in control, that you have a plan, and we know how it ends. And God, help us to rest in that and do your will. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks for watching, and we hope to see you here next week at Grace.